Hello. Um, can people hear me? Yes. All right. If Pretty you can good. hear me. Yep. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, I'm gonna paste the meeting link again. The the chat. Um, Evan and Andres, can can you guys hear us? Do we um, can we check the audio? See whether you guys are able to speak. Hi. This is Aronan here. Hey there. How are you? Good. Thank you. Thanks for your response. Yeah, no worries. Yeah, I will definitely sync up with you. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, I put the meeting document in the Zoom chat. So um, please go in there and um, mark your. Uh, put your name there for attendance. We are looking for two scribes today. Um, so if anyone can help scribe, please sign up as a scribe. Um, we're getting from Evan and Andres. Um, and, um, are you able to test out your mic? Just to make sure things are working. Hey. Okay, great, perfect. <laughs> Sorry about that, we were muted before. Awesome. No, I just just making sure that we are all all good on the AV section. Okay. And we won't do check-ins because we're having a presentation today, right? Yep. Okay, that's. So I think most um, there's quite a few people that will be at RSA today. So I don't think we ex we may be missing some of the regulars. Um, so, uh, I'll start off quickly with announcements and then we can, we can jump right into the, the presentation. Seems like we have a pretty lengthy one. Um, so again, I'm going to paste in the document over here. Um, uh, please sign in with, with your name, um, announcement for today. Again, um, if you haven't checked out the cloud native security day, uh, the zero day event, uh, day zero event at Coupon EU, check it out, um, get your tickets. Um, and I think, was it you who put this in, Sarah? We're looking for meeting facilitators in March. I think that was probably Dan. Oh, probably Dan, okay. Dan is lead chair this month. And next, <laughs> um, so, so yeah, so sign up if you are willing to facilitate a meeting. Um, processes in the governance. There's also, we um, hadn't had new members in the last month, and I don't think that's actually true. So call out that if you've been attending for a while and you're not on the member list, um, PR yourself in. We would love to have you officially join us. Yeah, I'm going to paste the new member, uh, the LinkedIn new member page as well. All right. So um, I guess then let's uh, start on with the Spiffy Spire assessment. So I think I'm gonna hand this over to... Um, I also just signed up as scribe. Does somebody wanna help? Mostly like just chime in and um, write down things if I happen to ask questions or talk. So we like to have two people so that somebody else can, so that pe scribes can also feel free to participate. All right. So yeah, um, I think Andrews, Evan, um, and the the other folks from Swift Inspire is going to bring us through a overview of what Swift Inspire is, and we're going to spend about um, five to ten minutes on uh, some of the uh, the results of the assessment, as well as where you can find um, the the documents that we created from this assessment, and then the rest is going to be Q and A. So, yeah, Andrews and Evan, take it away. Uh, we can't hear you, by the way, or at least I can't. You're able to hear me now? Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Brandon, and thanks, Sarah. As you said, the agenda here, given 
the time that we have available is to provide a very high level overview of both Spiffy and Spire. Talk about uh, where did it start, how did we get to where it's at today, what has been the work throughout that time, where are we going looking forward, and wrap up with the summary of the security assessment that we just conducted, you being the lead reviewer, along with the help of Emily Fox, Justin Capos, and other community members. With that said, uh, just to set the stage, uh, some of you may be familiar with Spiffy and Spire, given they're both CNCF projects. Uh, the goal of, the, of these projects and the catharsis of it really stems from uh, providing an identity framework that makes it easy for workloads for software components of a distributed system to establish trust given an untrusted network. And we're gonna, we're gonna peel into that, uh, pull the thread, look, look into what does that actually mean and why would we have even bothered to do that in the first place. The products were first accepted in the CNCF in March 2018. Um, it is very important to think of these solely as uh, authentication, not authorization. It certainly helps the conversation. Certainly people start associating a number of things. Uh, Want to preface with Spiffy is not authorization. Authorization is out of the scope of the project. It does provide uh, identities that can be surfaced to authorization frameworks uh, to interoperate with each other. One great example of another CNCF project is there. Uh, OPA, Open Policy Agent, Spiffy and OPA are uh, great complements to each other as you reason with uh, authorization authentication frameworks uh, holistically. Also, it is not transport level security. It can be uh, used as bits. We're going to talk a little bit about what that is. Uh, spiffy uh, identity documents, those can be used to facil facilitate TLS or job signing. But uh, it's, again, it's not a component of Spiffy nor, nor Spire. Let me actually switch with Emiliano's seats here because I'm right on the sunbeam, I'm starting to cook a little bit. <laughs> I'm sweating into the presentation earlier than I should have. So uh, just trip down memory lane uh, where it all started uh, right around KubeCon North America 2017. Uh, the community got together as a whole uh, to define a specification to tackle the problem Spiffy's after. Uh, and that problem is how to establish trust between software components of complex distributed systems over untrusted networks. Systems that uh, have the properties of, of cloud native, uh, a big part of that, the assumption that being while an, a team or an organization may own the application, they may not necessarily own or manage the infrastructure that that is running on. So how do we solve that? And we looked around for technologies that existed at the time, TLS being one of those, it certainly has been available for a really long time, uh, widely used for establishing trust from a browser to a server across the internet, wherever it may reside. However, we did not see a lot of TLS inside of the data center. And why would that be? Not because uh, it, doesn't address the problem, but getting certificates and key material for establishing TLS, it's quite a cumbersome problem when you look at systems that are elastic and dynamically scaled. Certainly it's very easy to put a certificate on a bare metal server, but a pod that may have just been instantiated, it's a harder, it's harder problem to solve for. So in coming together, one of the first things is how can we reason about automation that will keep the promises of PKI, but at high velocity and very large scale. Building around that, we, we said, well, let's, uh, uh, among the Spiffy specification, we need to define a number of things. Let's define what does an identity look like? And you can refer to the Spiffy docs and look like that is URI formatted. Uh, it's human readable. It is custom. 
from there on, uh, the format of the identity document that proves that identity des describing a workload. And those formats, uh, we initially supported X509. We added uh, bearer tokens uh, not long after that. Uh, there's, there's motivations why you may want to use one over the other. And third, uh, we uh, define a dead simple API for workloads to retrieve and validate a foreign end of the foreign party in the communication, uh, validate its trust, and uh, tying it back to TLS, uh, the property it confers is not only establishing trust between two systems talking to each other, but uh, establishing an encrypted uh, channel, uh, all, the, all the benefits and goodness that you get out of asymmetric cryptography. Uh, we couldn't just leave it at the spec. Obviously, quest questions arise. Said, well, how this all sounds great. How can I put this to practice? So a lot of groundwork went into defining the tool chain, uh, implementing it in practice, which is Aspire providing a reference implementation software components that people could, if you're running Kubernetes at the time or you're running uh, any other uh, x86 uh, unit space system, that you can uh, start to uh, implement the spec and have it running. Now, uh, fast forwarding a year into that and having Spiffy and Spire and Spire starting to grow and so for base use cases, a lot of the work went into extending support to integrate more tightly to different cloud providers, different middleware, different orchestration systems. We designed the system for it to be extensible and to support future use cases, uh, but at the same time for people to uh, I haven't spent much time talking about at the station, and I can I can clarify what I mean by that. But in order of as you're describing an identity that is assigned to be assigned to a system, in order to confer it, you need to go through a set of checks. Uh, you can define a policy and say uh, if this system uh, is about this tall, looks this way, has its properties. Uh, this is the kernel metadata that is available. This is what the orchestration platform knows about it. This is the metadata we get of CICD provenance. Tying all of this and if those checks are met, the identity is conferred. Obviously, those vary from uh, environment to environment and there's a lot of different properties and metadata depending to the different uh, cloud providers or uh, different platforms you may be deploying and inspire onto. So we built a bunch of plugins for Azure, Google Cloud, AWS. The community contributed a big part of it. A lot of work went into integrating uh, Spiffy and Envoy and uh, utilizing the Envoy SDS interface. Uh, one, of the, one, one of the motivations for that, a lot of people were looking at the spec and uh, writing their own apps and putting in libraries, teaching Spiffy to the application, but as they were modernizing traditional apps or, or things that have, had already been containerized, uh, they could utilize Envoy as a proxy to deal with uh, all the logic and just delegate uh, Spiffy Inspired to the infrastructure and not have to customize uh, much of that. Having, having addressed for inter interoperating across multiple platforms, multiple environments, uh, within the Spire realm, the Spiffy grew uh, in parallel at the same time. We saw adoption and embra embracing of the spec by a lot of different open source projects, some of them CNCF, uh, noteworthy ones, uh, Istio, HashCorp, Console, Network Service Mesh, Nginx, Gray Matter. Uh, the list is not limited to those. Uh, if you know of others that we may not know, uh, let us know on Slack, let us know at the end of the call. And, and it's re been really organic. It's been fascinating to, to see it grow. Now, uh, that, that work has been uh, super steady and 
not necessarily anticipated we, we knew we get to that like addressing for all those use cases that I've alluded thus far uh, and people establishing multiple Spire environments and different teams uh, implementing it, uh, it turned out that every system uh, was modeling for a single root of trust. Certainly uh, the need to uh, authenticate between different Spire uh, implementations that, or like a spiffy implementations if you have a Nestio service mesh that may need to communicate to an Aspire environment for a separate platform. Uh, the need to federate Spire to spiffy and spiffy to spiffy arose and that is at a very basic level, how can a system validate the keys of a foreign system outside on a different route of trust uh, without exchanging uh, private key material, solely exchanging their, their public keys. Th that is something we, we've started to, to document. Uh, at the most recent KubeCon, Evan did a talk with a gentleman from Google uh, about Spiffy Federation with Istio. Uh, please check that out. Uh, there's a lot, there's a wealth of, of information there on, on how can you set up multiple Spire domains to federate with each other. And in the same time and people coming to, uh, going through the journey of reasoning about Spiffy and Spire conceptually, to adopting the technology, uh, embarking on rolling it out to production, and, and having solved out for workload to workload and uh, essentially service to service, uh, it also came up the desire of, well, if we get all of this from uh, Spiffy, can we extend it to connect to other types of systems that we may have not necessarily built ourselves, but we consume, be it MySQL, be it Postgres, name the database, uh, people wanting to do secure introduction without having to pre-share any key material, user usernames or passwords, can we use the Spiffy IDs to directly authenticate to a database? And from there on as well, if, if we're able to do that, shouldn't we also be able to directly authenticate uh, to not a workload running in AWS from my on-prem environment, can I also authenticate to AWS directly? Can I uh, get an STS token and exchange with my SFID and uh, go to RDS or go to Aurora or any other cloud service? That is uh, somewhat of a, of a recent use case. Uh, we have solved for that and we did a number of demos at KubeCon San Diego uh, of using uh, Spiffy alongside with OIDC Federation. Uh, once again, just extending Spiffy Inspire to uh, talk to be it a database, cloud service, uh, the database not, not being OIDC, uh, but as an extension to that, you could also be talking about like secret stores here, uh, doing secure introduction to, to Vault as another example. So with that, I, I provide a very spitball run through of Spiffy and Spire, uh, taking uh, a closer look at the governance of this project. As I mentioned, this work hasn't just been Cytel, the corporate entity, uh, that we work for and is uh, stewarding the project, a lot of it has been driven by the community. Uh, some of the community members that are project owners, I call out this, the names here in the slide, Joe Beta, John DeBonis, Mark Lakewood, Tyler Julian, uh, these folks oversee uh, and have ownership of different components, different parts of, of the two projects. Uh, as part of preparing for the assessment, we spend a lot of time in CII best practices, uh, making sure we have the right boss factor, uh, 
and some of it like we we had to adjust and, and adapt ourselves to meet those things but it was also very reassuring that the way we'd structure things from uh, day one allowed us to to pass all, all that criteria not much to like spend there on that uh, i've shared some uh, community stats these are available from the cncf uh, dev staffs dashboards uh, we have seeing a pretty steady incremental trend uh, for uh, every single one of these uh, number of contributors, number of contributions increases, stars uh, have been increasing. Uh, as for Spire, which is once again, Swifty suspects Spire is uh, actual implementation. Uh, we did the CII best practices for Spire. We're currently at a passing as a recommendation from Brandon, Emily, and Justin. We're currently pursuing the silver batch. That is the next level up. One of the big items in there is code signing, which is something that is uh, actively being worked on and, and we should be able to uh, have available um, sometime in the future. Where are we going uh, forward? Uh, based on where we find us today. We talked about solving workload to workload. We have solved for an initial set of use cases often in cloud providers, uh, continuing to extend uh, the list of plugins, different platforms supported. Uh, but it, uh, until very recently said like, well, we, we've, been doing, we've been doing a lot of work the, our guiding principle is, has always been the community. What is top of mind for our end users? And we reassessed on, well, we wanna, we wanna make sure we enable for existing end users to do very large scale production rollouts. We're talking today in the scale of tens of hundreds of nodes, uh, Aspirationally, people are wanting to get to hundreds of thousands of nodes uh, in the short term. So around enabling those topologies, uh, we have some work to keep the lights on and address some technical depth of not just supporting X509 and nested Spire topologies when you have chains of Spire domains uh, to also support better tokens. At the same time, uh, the APIs have been stable for a while. However, uh, there's the assumption today, or there is the requirement today that Spire agents share the same kernel as the workload. With the advent of serverless technologies, uh, that is a little bit tricky to deploy an, an agent in there. Uh, that alongside uh, some other motivations, we are, uh, through, we completed the design phase of uh, API refactors for node and registration APIs, so we can address uh, future use cases such as agentless deployments, uh, being one of the big ones, some others being. Uh, agentless deployments, um, custom code that <clears throat> you might write to snap into an orchestrator or deployment system, for instance, making those things easier to do. Um, and also just, you know, we've got like, you know, the better of a year and a half to two years worth of organic growth on the current server API refactors, which they've, they've sufficed for the time being, but you know, as things evolve and as we look towards cases that don't involve an agent, that just involve workload talking to the server perhaps, um, the, those APIs are a little bit difficult to consume and, and um, on the back end, some of the code has been a little bit difficult to maintain as it evolved organically. So this refactor is kind of aimed at, you know, knocking out those additional use cases uh, just make, making everything a lot more cohesive given all the learnings we've, we've had in the last, in the last couple of years. And in working on that for our upcoming release, we came to the realization, hey, we cannot neglect the user experience making Spire easier to consume for newcomers or those yet to be initiated. Let's uh, update our existing client libraries and also expand that list. Let's put a lot of attention into documentation and integration of critical use cases. 
how conceptually how to use tutorials and and uh, completing this release from there on we can start to look deeper into uh, the stack vertically and testing from a uh, hardware root of trust uh, or testing uh, throughout the software development life cycle uh, how can we integrate better with frameworks like Encoto? How we can integrate with code signing technologies like Notary and Tough? Uh, let's keep focusing on the experience and make sure we're not being complacent or overlooking that. Let's make sure those things are documented, understood. We can have uh, interactive tutorials for a lot of these things. Uh, looking further into the year, and again, like these are forward-looking statements. Uh, make uh, the, the work that we do with the refactors uh, enhance for agentless workloads. Uh, once we have uh, binary siding, TPM siding uh, designed, let's implement that work. Uh, leading to that, like I, I skip revocation simplified HA, just but calling out big items here. Uh, and just a lot of it is day, day zero, day one, and from there on, let's do a lot of like automation that keeps the promises for, for day two and makes uh, life of operators easily. And again, like the goal of making inf infrastructure function to security as opposed to a lot of something developers need to spend a lot of time on, uh, just fulfilling the vision of, of the project. Uh, with that said, I think we can uh, checkpoint here and spend time talking about the assessment. What do you think, Brandon? Yeah, so so before we jump into the details of assessment, um, I think this would be a good time to kind of, if there are any questions about Swifty Spire clarifications, um, let's get through that before we jump into the assessment. I have not been looking at the chat window, but I'm watching the chat window, but I joined a little bit late. Uh, hey, everyone, this is uh, Saravanan here. Can you elaborate, can you share any one example where traditionally this is how the credentials have been passed along within the property file or configuration file. Now with the Spire and Spiffy spec and with your SVID or whatever the token names are, this is how the new design and the new connection will work. Is there a way that you can shed some light? Meaning- These credentials are, are short-lived. Uh, there's no hard-coded secrets here, and they're automatically rotated at customizable intervals. By the fault, what is the time to live of Nestle? About an hour. An hour. But you can fine tune that to the requirements of, of your environment. Um, I would say, like traditionally, like the, the traditional solutions push the management of secrets onto the operator, right? So, you know, the best thing that we that we really have today is probably a Kubernetes secrets, where you can say like this workload gets access to this secret and it kind of just becomes available to the workload in a boost because the orchestrator knows it should have access to it. Um, that's, that's, that's great. It solves one of the problems that Spire solves, which is how do I get that first secret? How do I get that first thing, right? Um, but it doesn't solve other problems, right? Like somebody still has to create that secret and, and store it as a secret in Kubernetes. Somebody has to manage the rotation of that thing. Rotation of Kubernetes secrets is also not secrets. Um, Spire, continues, Spire addresses all of those problems additionally, right? Because we, we expose something directly to the workload that doesn't require authentication and can automatically rotate things as they come and go and expire. Um, you know, there are the other like more rudimentary approaches include, um, you know, access to vault, for instance, which again, like you still need a vault to and somehow to access vault, right? Um, injection and like the CICD deployment process, which, you know, causes other problems. Obviously, rotation is a problem in that, in that scenario. You're also like giving CICD access to all the secrets in the world in order to do that. Um, so, so all the traditional approaches, um, Number one, the, the very few of them, if any, don't really treat rotation as a first class citizen. Very few of them address the secret zero problem or how do I get the first spread in. Um, and, very, and very few of them uh, operate in a way that pulls 
pulls management overhead off of the operator in terms of managing the lifetime and life cycle of these secrets, bootstrapping things, all that stuff is fully automated by Spire. So there are some existing solutions, solve some parts, okay, not well, so, so, so many other parts. Spire aims to kind of like eliminate all those pains by saying, you know what, like forget this secret management stuff. Like what, we, what we're really looking for is strong assertion of identity. And we can manage the life cycle of those identities, the rotation of those identities, the replication of those identities, et cetera, um, in a centralized way and a way that is very, very highly automated. Yeah. Removing the human from any of the steps in the life cycle, most importantly. None of those tasks are performed manually. I hope that that. Does that answer your question? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, I'll. Yeah, I know you mentioned about the secret zero. So that is where I think it kind of becomes like a catch-22. Or someone has to create it and someone has to share it. After you share it, you know, it's just out of your control. So what I understood is initially, I think the problem statement that you mentioned is you have, you are deploying your workload in a untrusted network, right? In yes. this, but then you need to safeguard your workload. So that is the reason why this PFI and Spire spec evolved. Yes, um, th there are a number of reasons. That's one of them to provide like a uniform notion of identity, which is not like tightly coupled to the underlying runtime or platform is another reason, right? Like any time that you have something in your data center that has to talk to an AWS resource or any time that you have to cross any of these kind of like IAM boundaries or platform boundaries, these things become problems. So that's another goal, right? Um, and I'll mention that, you know, the approach that Spiffy and Spire take to solving these problems do not require somebody to create that secret zero. All of that is automated. Uh, and in order to automate that, we lean on, we, we you know, uh, uh, Grace mentioned earlier that the system was designed to be super extensible. So all of like the kind of core logics that are involved in the automation of these processes are all pluggable, right? So if you're on AWS, for instance, we have an AWS plugin that knows how to like call the AWS API and see like what the instance ID of this caller is and like assert that it is your machine and assert like it is in this particular region of this auto scale group or this security group or what have you. The result of all those checks and authorizations uh, is the secret zero. Um, so so the, man, the, the creation and management of that secret zero and injection of that secret zero, that problem is like 100% negated through the use of Spivy Spire. Sorry, that problem is 100% I, I kind of... Negated, negated. The, 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 okay. the, yeah, the secret zero problem is, is, is essentially solved by Spivy Spire through this kind of attestation processes that that uh, Andres mentioned before, but the, the, the short of it is that you can boot a node and you can boot a workload under Spiffy Spire that does not have any secret baked into it or injected into it and still go from that to, okay, now we have an identity and we've, we've, we've issued a, a, a key. Okay. Definitely. Yeah. So to, to elaborate further on that and how we don't get to the catch 22, this is, this is policy driven. Like Spire is not seeding the secret zero is not is not doing the the provisioning and delivering of of that secret zero it from hey we're only automating the pairing of the credential that we're getting from somewhere it's we're we're chaining that sequence all together to like we define policy that has to be attested against and it's just bootstrap if this thing looks this way and it can emit proof, how can it go from, I've never seen this before, I have no idea who it is, to I understand very well, I have right now and fingerprinted the code. Here is the keys to what you, you have access to. Yeah, so so I, I think it's kind of like, it's 100% if you trust the model attestation that you want. So like, um, if you have a top provider and you trust the attestation service for that, then, um, in that model, it, the secret delivery is um, you solve that because your assumption is you trust the cloud provider. And then if you want, if you don't trust the cloud provider, 
then you would have to have the attestation be something to some hardware root of trust or something like that. That is a great point, Brandon. And, and you, there, there's something you have to trust, but like we spend a lot of time with end users on attestation strategies, identification strategies. Yes, you have to trust something and what is that you trust, but don't just trust one thing. So another analogy is multi-factor authentication well, let's let's get what can we get from the AWS instance metadata API? What can we get from Kubelet? What can we get from the Linux kernel? What can we get from the pipeline? And you can compose from all these different uh, sources uh, the information that's being relied upon. Sure. Hey guys, sorry, this is uh, Vinay Venkatragwin here and thanks for the explanation, but I was just wondering maybe if we could uh, uh, go down a little deeper for maybe a specific example. Let's say that you had a workload that is running on a Kubernetes cluster on GKE that wanted to talk to some kind of a database uh, that is running on RDS uh, or Aurora or something, right? So now the points of integration are, is there like a spot Fire agent running on every node as a daemon set and then there is a federation so where is so and there's a config that tells the workload to contact that particular agent uh, presents some kind of uh, uh, ID which then gets federated so how does the permissioning and where does the root get attributed can you walk through does that make sense to walk through that kind of an example yeah um, there I think there's a handful of questions kind of packed into there. So I, I might, yeah. in, in the interest of answering the final question, which was how does my GKE workload talk to S3, um, I'll briefly describe some of the, the earlier ones and then dive into the last one. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so uh, in the current model, there is an agent running as a daemon set. So there's an agent on every node. Right? Um, those agents follow this node attestation process that we've been discussing. Um, that allows Fire Server to positively identify which GKE cluster is coming from, which node in that GKE cluster it's been deployed on, all of that kind of stuff. Um, every agent exposes uh, what we call the workload API. So the, 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 thing, the way to think about the workload API is just kind of like the AWS SS identity, like the metadata API that AWS exposes. G, uh, GCP also exposes like a metadata service to every node um, that the node can call that doesn't have to authenticate to, but it can get something back, right? Um, so the workload API is that the agent exposes it. It's, it's very similar to, to this way. It is available only on that node, right? And it's nominally exposed as Unix domain socket. So what happens is every pod that launches on that node of the agent gets a Unix domain socket injected into it, and that socket serves this workload API. Uh, and, the sorry, workload and, this, and this Unix domain socket, is it one per node which is fixed at some configuration point which needs to be pointed to the workload? The, the, uh, yes, there's one per node and then the workloads pick up and get pointed at that socket. We're exploring okay. some models of some, and some future work that, that may allow an agent to expose multiple domain sockets. Um, but for now, it's just one. And then we inject that one socket into all the containers. Uh, and that socket is unauthenticated. So when one of these pods boots, it gets this socket injected and the workload talks to this socket. It does not need any kind of secret or credential to do that. Right. Okay. And then what's the next step that needs to happen? So the next step, get... the next step is that, you know, there's, there's been, Spire has been configured with some policy that Andres was kind of talking about before. We teach Spire about the shape of your workload and when it recognizes this workload to give it, you know, identity Alice, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so, so when the workload boots up, it talks to this, it talks to this Unix domain socket and it says, Hey, here I am. Like, give me, give me my identity. Spire says, okay, we figured out that you're Alice. Uh, here's a job that proves that you're Alice. Yep. Right. Okay. Now is, is the part where Alice can take this job and pass it to S to uh, AWS. So we talked a little bit about federation before federation is a way that spiffy trust domains can exchange can exchange their public signing keys in an automated fashion. This federation API is highly aligned with OIDC, OAuth OIDC. Uh, so a lot of OIDC providers are compatible with this thing. So what, what you do is you configure AWS for an external identity provider. 
you point it at this Federation API on your Spire server. And then when Alice comes along, Alice calls a, a STS service and says, hey, I want to exchange this web identity, so to speak, the web S in AWS terms. I want to exchange this web identity for an STS token. Yep. AWS is able to validate that Alice's token by using this Federation API bridge. And then what Alice gets back is an STS token that she can now go to access S3 or whatever other AWS resource she can use. So Im implicit in this is two types of configuration, right? One is on the AWS side, which has its own permissions, which says there is some identity that could be federated through this other entity, which has access to RDS or whatever. And exactly. then on the Spire side of things, the Spire server, which actually does that federation, there is another policy which says, what, what would that policy look like? That policy, uh, we, th there's not really any policy that would be required on the Spire side around federation. We just expose the, the endpoint at a configurable address. But the, the policy that you would define in Spire is about the workload, right? So you would say, hey, you need to know who Alice is when Alice calls you, right? So we'll describe Alice. We'll say, hey, we have this workload called Alice. Uh, she runs in this namespace and with this service account, and it should be this Docker image ID, and it should be all of these other attributes you can kind of tie together and say, when, all, when you see this, all these attributes meet, that's Alice. Right. That's uh, the but what of the I, I'm sorry, maybe what allows Alice to talk to that RDS instance? Ah, that is, a, that is a, um, an AWS side oh, configuration. Okay, so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, on AWS, when you um, when you configure this token exchange, first you, you configure it to point back at Spire, at uh, Spiffy Spire as the identity source. And second, you create a mapping in AWS. So you say Spiffy ID Alice uh, maps to I am role foo. Got it. So okay. I think we have another question from Chase about um, node level versus workload. And why do we deploy an agent and not a sidecar? Let's see. I'm trying Chase, to do you want to you want to say your question out loud? Yeah. Yeah, there's an evolution there based on the granularity of my misunderstanding. <laughs> um, but sort of the the base of the thing is, and I'm thinking. It's not a question of design decision. I'm mainly just wondering, you know, a lot of the initial uh, description there from the previous question was kind of talking about the node agent and authenticating kind of at the node level. And maybe the authentication at the node level involves metadata pulled out of a pod, so to speak. But essentially, we're still trusting the node to tell us the truth. <clears throat> or at least, you know, and that's a reasonable assumption, or we're trusting that the node understands the workload enough, or I don't know a better way to say that. But I'm, I guess I'm wondering, does all the communication happen from the node itself? Um, does the pod itself reach out post? Like, does the node say, okay, you got brown eyes, you got red pants you're you're a good node right you're a bob and then individual workloads on that node are then able to kind of add on to that in series and say you know you have uh image id whatever and your you know, hash of your code bases whatever um uh is that an in series thing is that one exchange that happens at the node level uh, and mainly I'm thinking in terms of like service mesh, you know, which kind of operates in a sidecar fashion, the workloads themselves are sort of can be completely agnostic from the node. Um, or at least that's the way kind of I'm, we're running things now. Yeah. And so I'm just wondering kind of where does the exchange happen for our sort of, uh, sort of this heuristic profiling yeah. of, of node versus workload. Am I, I making I, any sense? I think I think I think I understand where you're going here. Um, so that comparison, that attestation, we call it that comparison that, that you were saying. You know, how tall are you? What color shorts are you? Whatever. Um, that kind of happens twice. All right. Uh, so I'll back up maybe by saying that a lot of folks have a very strong desire to not to know not just that you're my authorized workload, but that you're my authorized workload running in the spot where you're supposed to be running. Right. So. Uh, the node angle is 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 there for that reason, right? Um, the way that the way that those challenges, these attestations work, is that when the agent comes up, 
you know, we don't rely on anything, like the agent certainly communicates information to the server to say who it is, but the server has all sorts of checks and, and balances that it goes through to assert that that is true, right? Um, that, once that happens and that completes, the server is able to say, I know for sure that I have a connection open to instance ID 1234 in Amazon region, US West 2, or what have you, right? The result of that uh, interaction between the server and the agent is that the server now issues identity to the agent. So everything that happens after that uh, is done with like mutual TLS between the agent and the server using this kind of like foundational platform level identity. Um, beyond that, we have like also taught Spire about the workloads and what shape the workloads are and who they get signed by or what all this kind of stuff, right? Um, in addition to defining the shape of that workload, we also say where that workload should be running. Right, so that, that workload might be running on Kubernetes cluster one, or it might be running on a very specific instance inside Kubernetes cluster one, right? Um, so it is, it is up to the agent uh, to measure the workload, right? And, and the server, for lack of better words, trusts the agent to do that in a, in a trustworthy way, right? But uh, the server still has authorization control, so you know, if you have a node compromise or an agent gets owned or something like this, you can't just you can't just call the server and ask for any arbitrary thing. Like this, you will only be able to obtain identities that the server says these are the workloads that are supposed to be running on this node right now. Um, so it's kind of like a two-level process, um, and and I, I hope that I'm answering your question here. Um, so I'll stop, but just to make sure that I'm going in the right direction. Yeah, you are. Okay. I think well, I, I think I'm with you now. I I okay. wasn't sure about you know, the two stage thing and, and really what the second stage meant, I guess, so to speak, how the workloads themselves yeah, so that was direct or through the agent. And so that may. Yeah. So when the agent pops up and it talks to the server and the server is able to identify an issue an identity, one of the other things that, that the server tells the agent is, Hey, here are all the workloads that you're authorized to run. Right. Uh, and here are the shapes of those workloads. So when you see workload with this shape or that shape, here's the thing that you're authorized to get for it. Um, right now, the agent pulls down that list and then caches up everything in advance. So if there's an outage, a server outage or something like that, things kind of continue to run. There have been some requests to maybe like do like a just-in-time issuance, uh, which doesn't really affect the security model, but may affect some of the scaling properties. Uh, but, but as of now, there's a, there is kind of like this, this two-step thing where the agent comes up, gets identified, understands what it's allowed to run. And then when the workload calls, the agent already knows, hey, I know that you're Alice because I see all these parts. The server told me to be expecting you. I see all these things match up. Like, here's your S code. And, and you can control the granularity of that node attestation rule, too. That, that's one of the big thing. So if you want to scope it down to one node, you can. You can loosen that up and uh, put it to your a bigger part of your fleet. To take it back up, conceptually, <clears throat> we distinguish the two stages, the first being node at the station, the second one being workload at the station. And, and those, right. are, those are separate, but obviously, yeah, like once node attests, we say, hey, here's a list of spiffy IDs and selectors you should uh, look out for that, that are available to you. All right, uh, let's uh, wrap up this uh, question maybe, and then we can go ahead with the assessment specific things. I'll take from your uh, chat message that we, su <laughs> we sufficiently answered your question. Okay. Um, I think I'll grab the sharing and then I can go through the, the session. Sure. Why don't we do that? Yeah. Uh, can you drop off the sharing? Yes, I can. Uh, stop share. I, I do want to share, it was very beneficial for us to go through uh, the formal assessment with the current process. Uh, we had conducted, well, the team had conducted an initial assessment about two years ago, uh, Justin Kapos, Evan, and a few other folks. Uh, so this is the second go around, but like the structure definition, it was uh, super easy to follow. And, and just the level of attention we got from the uh, reviewing team, uh, it helped us like identify a bunch of blind spots we had. 
Yeah, it's a pleasure working with you guys as well. Uh, so yeah, so let's jump into it. So um, I've created a PR for the Spy Assessment Branch. Uh, and so if you, so all the information about uh, the assessment documents are over here. Uh, let me go through them quickly. So if you want to make some comments on the self-assessment or the summary of the assessment, uh, you can go to this PR, which um, we'll put the link into the, the meeting notes. Um, and so for this assess assessment, let me go through quickly what the summary of it was. Uh, I think the, the, the self-assessment that was brought to us by uh, by the team was very, very comprehensive. The most, the most comprehensive one we've seen so far. It was uh, really long. And I think this was partly because um, you, know, you guys have been through the process with Justin uh, and a lot of the details were already there. So I think it, it was really smooth. Um, so the summary of this, we have the security assessment um, and um, these, again, the background summary is kind of like what we just talked about. Um, and the recommendations that we are making um, for the project is um, one is that they have a lot of information about um, threat modeling materials that I think um, are very useful. And then we, we would want to see uh, these items on the Spiffy site. Um, one of the other recommendations is also um, to expand the security response team um, to participants also outside Sidetail. And the last one, which uh, Andres has mentioned just now, is to work towards the CI silver batch, which uh, Swifty and Inspire is already very close to that. Um, and at the same time, our recommendations to the CNCF is because Swifty and Inspire is a security centric. Um, project that we want to ensure that we conduct a formal review or audit for this. So kind of like the, you know, whether this would be a trail of bits or a, a formal uh, security review for this. Um, and also um, the advanced users for Spiffy and Spire where you have uh, federation and more complex topologies uh, is something that um, we think would be helpful if we have additional materials or, or, or information that the CNCF can help educate uh, users about. So the assessment itself, I'm gonna go through it really quickly. Um, so this is a really long document. Um, it talks about more details about what exactly the goals and on goals are. Uh, and you know, uh, we, we had a few additions to this to kind of make the document more comprehensive, more readable to uh, a user. So there are a lot of definitions here. Uh, there's a use case, multiple use cases talking about MTLS um, in a lot of detail. So uh, this document is meant to be uh, readable to the general um, security user. And uh, I think one thing that uh, we really want to highlight in this assessment is that the, on top of the very comprehensive documentation is that the threat modeling that was done um, goes really, really deep into this. So they did, um, we have the security analysis of the different functions, the different plugins, uh, and then um, the team also created a lot of details on the different types of attacks. And also um, they have this matrix over here, which really talks about, you know, what are the, all the different uh, attack scenarios and what are the risk of them. Um, the red here doesn't mean it's bad. It just means it's highly likely. So um, don't be too alarmed. The, the, what you want to look at is actually the, the value of the score. Um, so yeah, I think that um, overall this, this it has been a, a good experience working with the Spiffy Spire team. And um, I think we are almost out of time. So if you have anything specific to the uh, assessment, you can write some comments in there. Um, 
Okay, um, Andreas, Evan, uh, and folks, anything from your side? Um, no, I think uh, from us, we just want to make sure that, you know, obviously this is <clears throat> our first time going through this this new process and we just want to make sure that, you know, we've, we've not necessarily met the expectations, but that, you know, all the questions have been answered and that, you know, we've, that there's nothing that folks were expecting that, that we haven't kind of presented or done or addressed in some way, shape or form. No, I think we are all good. Um... The only outstanding item would be to, we will bring this up to the TOC and ask them if they want um, an overview of the security assessment. Uh, if not, we will, we will just send this, um, the set of documents to the TOC. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, if not, uh, I think this this was great, and thank you for bringing us through Spiffy and Spire. Yeah, no, thanks, again. Well, one thing I want to call out briefly, and Brandon, you, you mentioned this uh, recently, was, uh, well, we, we wrote this without making any assumptions of prior knowledge or familiarity with Spiffy and Spire. So for those who are not familiar with the project, this is, uh, if you read uh, through, it's very much an introductory guide. It's not just the security properties or the modeling, there's a lot of background concepts, information, use cases there. So yeah, uh, it's a good starting point if you're interested to learn more. Yeah, if you want a uh, bedtime reading, this is a good document. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Emily uh, or Justin, if you're on the call, do you have any uh, comments, questions? I don't. I just want to say it was excellent working with the team and working on my first security assessment with everyone. Awesome. Great. And, uh, Likewise. I'll just add that I had a fun time doing the previous uh, one. And I do want to, um, because we're also congratulatory, I do want to throw in a slight, not really curveball, but thing to, for us to think about, which is um, from the time that I did the original uh, like whatever pre-assessment thing, whatever we want to call that, um, till now, there's been a very substantial uh, change in that they now allow federation of uh, identity across different like Spire servers. And so I think a question for us to think about is um, as we evolve things over time, how do we do that? Do we just do it so that um, we just add the text in the document with no indication of what's new? Uh, like somebody has to look through the commit history, do we have some way of saying, here's the addendum that happened, um, you know, in the last, you know, in the last year or whatever, when we do a reassessment. Um, so that's just more of a process thing for us to, to uh, think about and to consider when we're thinking about um, what we've assessed and what it applies to and how to, how that evolves over time. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And it's, it's, you know, I'm, I'm happy to also kind of add, 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 you know, some thought share to how we might be able to accomplish that. I think that's definitely an important point. And there certainly has been some drift since that original assessment was done. That, that assessment was, um, <clears throat> took a very long time. <laughs> it was very involved. Uh, and so, you know, a low overhead way to kind of, of, of keep these things updated would very, very much uh, be appreciated. Making sure it's long, long lived needs to be relevant. Sure. Yeah. Awesome. Great. Well, thank you, everyone. And um, um, so before uh, Dan, is Dan Shaw here? Dan Shaw is not here. So yes, he is, but maybe he's not on. So Dan and I, we're going to stay after. And on Tuesday is the TOC meeting where we monthly present stuff from SIG. So. Um, we have some draft slides if, you know, if anybody wants to join a small group, right? Like I'm particularly like Brendan, Justin, um, Kappa, like wh whoever's like, you know, in some kind of a project lead role, um, if you have something, you can also just tell us in Slack, but if anybody wants to stay on and we're just gonna work through the slides a little bit about what we're gonna present on Tuesday, if you happen to be free. Otherwise just ping us on Slack if you want um, something included to report back to the TOC. So now that I've unmuted myself, I'm here. All right. So everybody can feel free to go. Hey, Sarah, just real quick. Um, 
there's registration numbers in the SIG security events channel uh, if you Great. want to incorporate those in your slides. Will do. All right, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Let me see if I can get back on Slack video. Slack, uh, Zoom. Yeah, ideally, we would like stop the recording and start it again so that we don't have this like epic. Should we, should we all leave and then come back? Uh, well, I think we can. Um, who signed in as SIG Security? I'm going to sign or out. Or we can jump in. over to, to my Zoom. Well, I'll, I'll just, I don't want to interrupt. So um, why don't you bring up the slides? I'll go log in as SIG Security and um, unless you want to. Whatever you want to do, Dan. I, I hate to do this, but I have another meeting that's going to start in a minute. Um, okay, do you want to uh, tell us what you're... Yeah, I mean, I, I've been working, other than the stuff that's kind of obvious from where we're at with assessments, um, uh, uh, Brandon and I have been working a bit on the landscape thing and have some, um, some, up, like, some progress and updates there. Uh, I don't know what else... Uh, I mean, I have more personal things that I've been doing, like with the notary V2 stuff and things, but I don't really have anything else to report to the TSC that I can think of, in, unless there's something you think I might be missing. Oh, I just counted up. You, Brendan, Justin, Emily, who's not here, are voted in as tech leads. We have oh. four. <laughs> yeah. Congratulations. Yay. <laughs> so last night, Dan, I just, I added a slide. Let's just stay here. I'll tell. Um, I thought, yeah. Good uh, can you bring up the slides? Um, I put like I, I, I made a. I'm, dis a, dis I'm disembodied uh, audio. Oh. <laughs> I'll find it. Um, uh, I, I'm sorry, but I am going to have to stop. Oh yeah, um, feel free to jump. I'll sh I'll ping you the slides so. if you want. Yeah, and if anything else comes up, just ping me on Slack, and I'm, I can provide more context. So. Thank you, and I'll try to watch the recording of this afterwards and see what I miss. Okay, thank you. Oh yeah, don't worry about this. We'll just send you the slides so you can review them. Thanks, Justin. I'm grabbing them. So I'll stick them in the chat. Uh, and I'll project too. If I can figure out how to do this. All right. So the um, the one I added was just like a like I took like the email and um, kind of shortened it so that it would be um, uh, just highlights and pictures. Um, so like. I'll say, I think that it would be good for the three of you to like review it and make sure it's accurate and you know, um, feel free to. Could you, things. could you, um, my, my name has a spelling. Oh, what's your name? S B R A N D O N. O N. O B R. Brandon. Oh my God, I spelled it wrong when I sent it to everybody in the world. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm going to let you see. Usually I have this autocorrect thing. Um, Emily and Kappos. That's indoctrinate all the tech leads into uh, our monthly reporting. <laughs> Immediately. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome <laughs> to the Admiris <laughs> Trivia of SIG Security. Um, we, have, uh, we have a new member this morning. That, that was already updated. No, oh, no, you no, already no. updated it. Okay. Yeah, we have um, so many people that are on the calls and don't actually sign up. Yeah. Um, so we we 
this already happened. The reason why I was key meetings was because that was uh, happening. And that was one of the things that uh, I thought folks might want to go back and um, connect with. Well, yeah, so maybe like, you know, recent. Why don't we do that? Or like uh, uh, recent highlights. Maybe we can say we do the cloud custodian, which is really from December, but where it's sort of top of mind, right? And then uh, maybe we just put a date on here. Um, and I think if we link these, it'd be good recent highlights. I don't know if there are any other presentations in the last month or two that we want to highlight. Um, if somebody can look back in the... I have, um, let me look at that. We did the one with Jonathan Meadows. Um, oh, that was great. Yeah, um, let me find the date for that one. Then it was month though. I think, but I don't know that we talked about it. Oh, we have actually passed things here. Uh, 22nd of January. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, we, because of the vote, we didn't have a February. So then threat modeling. He said that was January 22nd. Yep. Okay. So I think if we link the videos, that would be cool. Oh, I don't want to do that. I want to put a comment so we remember to do it. Um, and then we also want to have Cloud Native Security Day. Every time you say day zero, I think you're going to talk about a zero day exploit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then do we want to, you recently made a triage board. I'm still working on it. It's, it's for, not ready yet. I wonder if our project tracking board is up to date. Oh, we should have the, uh, this is a good way to talk about security. I have not done anything on the microsite. JJ's working on the, po I don't know what happened to the policy white paper. Never really got finished. I did ping um, Howard about like, can we land that PR? Oh, the map. Is this what you're working on? Brendan? Sorry, which one? The landscape stuff. Uh, Was this a reasonably well, re representative? It could be like, would it be accurate to say that the work you're doing falls under this issue or is there a different there's it's a totally different thing. Uh, this was kind of looking at the old landscape. Uh, I don't think Justin and I created an initial for it, which we should. Would you, can you take a look at this and see whether this should be, like if we're not going to do this work and we're doing what you're doing instead, maybe we should modify this. Yeah. Because this is really like, this. this is a placeholder for what do we do after we have a draft from two years ago? Right, or right, a year right. ago, right? So this I, is for like next steps on the landscape, but you could also make a totally different new issue if that if there's other stuff that's worthwhile in this issue, right? But it's just not what you're doing. Yeah, I, I think that um, I can probably create a new issue that references this one. Okay, that'd um, be good. Yeah, one then fall.
And then we want to add the new cloud native security day. Let me just check with the, we don't have anything existing. Oh, this we did. I got the card security landscape V2. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's, it's really V1. Like we have a draft. <laughs> Just say like beta. <laughs> um, next iteration. Iteration two. How about that? Okay. Because I want to call it V2 because we didn't have a V1. <laughs> Not to be picky, but can you make it a project? If you put the project tag on it, then it automatically shows up oh, okay. in my okay. ad card. Yeah. I'll and um, the Cloud Native Security Day must not be, must not have a project tag. Okay, it's still a proposal. <laughs> I think we can elevate it to a project by now that we are already announcing it. Oh, and then we need the, um... there we go. Oops, here, add cards. Maybe I have to reload. Is there anything else that you can think of that's like going on like a project? Um, well, the spiffy security. Like it should be a project. That we just did. Well, those are on a different board. Okay. They get their own board. Um, let me just look sure. Right. Here they just appear as the first five security assessments, right? Like that's the umbrella project. And then some projects get their own board. Well, we, we had like minor things happen, like the logo and design page, um, the review tooling, additions to supply chain uh, catalog. I don't think okay. anything that's big enough to be a project. Okay, we'll just, yeah, maybe just skip it. Um, but I think that this kind of overview be nice. And so we can do that next. Just put a note here because I it's hard for me to screenshot when I'm in this resolution. Project tracking. Um Maybe we should have a whole screen for Cloud Native Security Day. Because like there's the site and that's the registration. So, um, so we wanna add registrations. And uh, um, Dan, are you still there? I am. Do, we, do you know? Do you have a, any thoughts? Can you see my screen, or are you just listening? I can. Do you, do you have thoughts about the order, the sequence for these things? Uh, tech leads first. Um, you know, I would put them in order um, as we present them in the first screen. Right. So tell them what they're going to tell them, tell them the thing. And we probably don't need to do the tell them what you told them. <laughs> um, oh, I guess you've removed the, um, well, I removed them because it was a slide. So, cool. um, Cool. Tech leads, yeah, the, uh, uh, first, um, and then 
Maybe uh, have big cloud news news and then administrativa. Yeah, we'll do cloud native security day last because it's like upcoming stuff, right? Okay. Because then it's like more in sequence order. And so we just do like administrativa in the middle. Well, not administrativa, but like an overview of what we're doing really. Oh, what everybody's going to ask about is the projects that are in the queue. So we have a different thing that we now need to manage, which is this project review, proposal review or something like that. Um, maybe we should just Wait for projects. So there's a um, there's a process. There's the new process that's been defined, right? It's not really a new process. It's in theory, what the CNC CNCF has done is document the current process. However, every it seemed like every project was going through a slightly different process because oh, we I saw the following image, a process, right? right? Yeah. So like, for example, this is a very nice thing that like Liz pulled together after there was like a whole bunch of different PRs, right? Which sets up what is actually happening, right? That there's this sort of low barrier to sandbox, a really significant barrier to incubation, and then incubation to graduation is, should be just like a matter of the project growing and getting better and checking like, you know, like it shouldn't be really, um, it's not a big, it's a big barrier just because there's a lot of work to do, not because we're putting a barrier in front of the project, right? It's a maturity thing, right? So it should be a natural path from incubation to graduation. And so the key thing here is like Cloud Custodian, like I don't even remember how they were referred to us exactly. Um, I'm not sure that they were I think somebody told them to go talk that, that, that if they wanted to become a CNCF project, they needed to go through the SIG. So they never filed a GitHub issue for a project proposal. Like they were asking me, should we do this, you know, should we finish the whole assessment review thing or should we short circuit it and just do the due diligence, right? To, you know, just become a member of the CNC at first and then come back to this, right? And a big how I answer the amount of work it is to get to just get into the CNCF without the assessment depends on whether they're going for sandbox or incubation. And that information isn't present anywhere, right? So instead of asking them, I was like, oh, we missed a point in the process. Please file this GitHub issue, right? Something should never really come to us until the project has done a GitHub issue. But there's all these projects that are in like out of order things, right? And then what we have to figure out. So we have now two projects, Dex and Camus, who've been referred to us, who have, um, who, who have filed this, who are going through what is now the well-documented sequence of things to become a sandbox project. And so we have to be like, okay, how are we going to handle that? So, and, so presentation, uh, this is, is this assessment or just a general presentation? Well, this is, so I think we have to decide what we want to ask of them, right? When they do this and we have talked about what we, what sort of our plan of record was that we won't ratify anything about the assessment until after the first five, but that generally we would ask people to do a self-assessment before they came into CNCF and, but not block approving them based on our review. And now, well, except there's like a, and now what ended up in the document is that actually the SIG review is a really low bar. It, it like specifically says it's a very lightweight review and that it is not due diligence. So this was a, it's possibly that it was just confusion on my part, but it was certainly not written down clearly they are decoupling. So now there's in the incubation phase, they do, they have this due diligence where what they wrote down is the TOC may delegate that to the SIGs. Mm. Right? My guess is 
insecurity, they're always going to delegate it to us. <laughs> right? Like nobody's going to be like, yeah, I want to do diligence on a security project when they have us, right? Um, <laughs> but it's not written down that way, right? So what we could do is like, you know, what we need to do is sort of figure out where does our assessment fit in here? My guess is it fits in here. We're not going to like ratify anything until after we do the first five and we clarify our process and we know how long it takes and blah, blah, blah. But we should come up, we should have like some like theory of how we do this. Um, but right now we're over here in the process, right? Where the SIG assessment, this, the TOC has defined project presents the SIG and this is for any SIG, right? We can tweak it and say, Hey, you're doing SIG security. We want you to do X, Y, Z, which is a little different, right? Mm -hmm. That's fine. As long as it's sort of in, it's sort of in the spirit, but the spirit is it's lightweight, right? It's not due diligence. And I also like, don't want to get into the situation where we ask this project, like, you know, like we did with key cook. Here, do a ton of work. Now the TOC is going to reject you. Yeah. That was kind of sucky. So the self-assessment is, it, it says one to two months here, yeah, which sounds yeah, like... That's the SIG assessment, right? So I think this also is allowing for there's a queue. Oh, oh okay. Right? Like so suppose this is... we get an influx of 10 projects. Right, right, okay. We so... want to set the expectation. Well, it might take a little while. To, we might have a full calendar. Okay. So one to two months is not the, uh, it's, it's, a, it's the total waiting plus processing time, not just processing time. Wall clock, not. Okay, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> good, good, good way to put it. <laughs> um, so we have this not defined process, right? For how do we do this? Um, you know, the default is like, you know, chairs and tech leads, you know, we like, you know, take, you know, just do whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, there's a PR here for, um, not there, there's a PR for a template so that a bunch of the chairs of the other SIGs um, were like, oh my God, we're going to have to do all this. And they're really small. Like they're like, you know, they've got like three to five people in the SIG, right? In some of the newer SIGs. And they're like, oh my God, we're going to be like having to do all this stuff. Um, and so, I, and I love that they've made a template, right? So they're basically like, okay, let's have a template of what, um, like, what are all the things? Um, and so, we don't want to, like, I think the idea is that whoever does this, this is this, my thinking that what this is, is this allows us to potentially delegate this to somebody in the SIG to, to write this down. And it's sort of a, it's a little bit of a checklist. Okay, well, have they done a presentation? You know, like, do we know, do, like, a sort of quick reference to all the things so that we can say, like, okay, we looked at this, we understand it, um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and so, this is just a proposal, right? Um, which is like this was written before the other doc. But this is for the TOC, right? It's not really for us. This is us providing the TOC with information. Mm, okay. Well, it's sort of for us. So basically the TOC is saying, hey, SIG, um, hey, project, go meet with the SIG. Tell them all about yourselves. They're the subject matter experts so that then they can tell us whether they think you're a good fit for the CNCF. And we're not decisional. We're, we're like a, we can, we can give a soft no that the TOC can override, right? And our yes is more likely to make a TOC yes, but we're not decisional. We're just like a data point that the TOC takes into account when it decides. So the, without the prior doc, Erin Boyd, and I can't remember which thing she's leading, uh, wrote this up as, well, if we are going to be like, make a recommendation to the TOC, what do we amongst ourselves want to have looked at, right? So that, so that we can delegate this to a SIG member 
who would like be like, oh yeah, I'll go meet with that project and learn all about it and write something up. And then everybody can read it and ask questions and be like, okay, yeah, here, here's something about this project that makes us say yay or nay, right? Like under what condition would we say yay or nay? What is the sort of information we want to have thought about? So, so, so yeah, this is all like not exactly for Tuesday, except that I'm anticipating on Tuesday, they might say, oh, so what's your plan for evaluating these two projects? And we'll be like, uh, so, um, so the, I mean, we could go ahead. The, there seems like there's some overlap with the self-assessment, right? Um, especially on the architecture. Um, stuff like that. Right. So like use cases. Yeah, this is where I think we should take advantage of this being in PR. There's like a bunch of this information. There's information in the proposal. There's information in the due diligence later. There's stuff in our self assessment. Like it might be good to do um, like sort of in a big like we should, you know, this would probably be a different breakout. But like um, Is there parts of our self-assessment that are redundant with other things where we should be like, oh, this is actually comes out of your project proposal or something like that so that they don't have to keep regurgitating the same information in lots of different places, right? Um, but, but, like, but I feel like we're getting into a conversation where we should like have a, we should have a meeting with all the tech leads. Yeah, this seems very, um, this is pretty meaty. Yeah. So maybe just for the Tuesday thing, um, we could just be like upcoming, right? And we can be like, there's a new process, right? Um, upcoming. And then, um, we want to add like uh, project reviews. proposals because also I think we want to invite anybody who happens to be at this meeting to chime in on the proposals right so we could do them a service by being like yeah we'd love everybody's feedback on the project proposals right and then um, you know that can be an input I feel like the next one may be a bit controversial because of um, Key Club. It's, it's very, very similar. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we will get into that. So um, so I'm actually about to, my battery's about to run out. I think this is good prep for Tuesday. Um, we can tag team the extra slides. Yeah. And uh, I'll I have like three conflicting meetings on, <laughs> on that slot. Um, I'll, I'll try and listen to like two of them at the same time. Um, yeah, I don't, I mean, I think if you can't come, it's not the end of the world. It would be nice, but like, yeah. I'm sure I'll talk about you. you. Talk, yeah, your ears could be burning. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, uh, I gotta, I gotta drop too. Uh, thanks Sarah. Uh, Brendan, welcome. Uh, great to have on you on board officially as a tech lead. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Bye, everybody. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah.